Um, my presentation today is, um, as Professor Brandt already mentioned, um, part of my um, book on the history of insect studies uh, and is actually a chapter on human thought on insect sex in the 18th century. Um, you may excuse a few jumps in my presentation because I had to cut a lot, of course, from a chap chapter to this uh, presentation, uh, but I hope it's going to be okay. Um, the talk today is inspired, uh, first of all, uh, on the left-hand side by uh, Johann Wilhelm Meyer's frontispiece for Blumenbach's uh, 1781 uh, book on the Bildungstrieb and the Zeugungsgeschäfte that uh, Wolfgang Böker already uh, mentioned, and um, especially the kind of similarities that is, are drawn between humans um, uh, and other animals um, in this frontispiece and also plants. And there's so much to unpack in this uh, picture and uh, it would be lovely to do that in another kind of conference. Um, um, and it's also, um, sorry, I just uh, missed one slide, so I just realized. Anyway, it's, uh, the, the talk is also inspired by uh, Steve Shapin's uh, a brilliant, brilliant book, Never Pure, and especially its uh, fantastic uh, subtitle, um, because the talk today is also a history of science as if it was produced by people with bodies situated in time, space, culture, and society, and struggling for credibility and authority. Um, as you will see later, this is not so much an intellectual history of the Bildungstrieb, but a history of practices and the social lives of scholars and collections. The later part of my talk uh, grew out of my earlier engagement with Blumenbach and image image making practices, um, especially in relation of the formation of Blumenbach's scientific racism. As I have shown elsewhere, images and the collaboration with artists were an important part of Blumenbach's scientific program. Uh, I therefore also put um, an interesting quote here uh, when uh, that Blumenbach uh, wrote to his, um, one of his um, favorite uh, artists, uh, Daniel uh, Chorivetsky, who was mentioned yesterday already, uh, and um, in this quote, you can see I highlighted the problems that Blumenbach encountered by depicting um, sex and sexuality. Uh, he says that he wanted to um, have, um, it is difficult to uh, depict the Zeugungsgeschäfte in an expressive, understandable, but at the same time respectable way. Uh, well, it was about sex, wasn't it? So let's jump right into the matter. Um, when Cole Porter wrote his suggestive double entendre in 1928, most people would have been aware that birds, bees, and even educated fleas indeed do it. In the early modern period, however, popular opinion on insect reproduction was still largely based on the Aristotelian concept of spontaneous generation. Yet in the 17th century, natural historians began to challenge this long-standing concept, which held that insects came into being out of mud, manure, and other decaying matter. And I assume you have heard uh, about this yesterday in Mike Olson's talk. So I'm going to uh, mention this only very briefly. Uh, it is important to note that this theory, however, was eventually discarded fully in the 18th century when a growing number of naturalists argued that copulation and functioning reproductive organs were indeed necessary for the proliferation of invertebrates. Through microscopic observation and experimental methods, scholars studied insect behavior and reproductive cycles and thereby altered understandings of sex beyond the insect world. As many users of these techniques discovered reproductive organs and observed female and male insects actually engaging in the act, Spontaneous generation slowly vanished as an explanation for how creepy crawlies came into the world. In a nutshell, I, a nutshell, I hope to show today that by studying textual and visual sources concerned with the sex life of non-human animals, we can uncover interesting aspects of more general debates on metaphysical and physical aspects of life and nature as such, of, of life and nature as such in which many 18th century authors uh, were involved, uh, the debates, of course, Blumenbach uh, prominently among them. I will also analyze very briefly the connections between text and image in the production of knowledge, um, the production of knowledge claims, and of course, the notion of gender, which are so entangled in the, the discussions of sexuality. <clears throat> 
And of course, uh, with Blumenbach, the, the notions uh, of race uh, come into play here as well. Finally, I would like to address the discourse which related the study of non-human animals with interferences on human behavior, including the moral assessment of it. I will not go into detail here, um, as I said, because I, I guess you have heard uh, parts of it, um, some of it on, in, on spontaneous generation in Mike Olson's talk. Let me just say a few words. This slide is uh, on the left hand side is uh, the frontispiece uh, from William Harvey's Exertationes de Generatione Animalium, published in 1651, and the detail in the middle uh, is important. This is often considered the groundbreaking work to establish the notion that all life sprang from eggs, or as the frontispiece says, ova omnia. Um, here. Unfortunately, um, I will only keep this very uh, short here, um, uh, but if you're interested in reading about the 17th century egg and sperm race, I can only recommend Matthew Cobb's eponymous book published in 2006. As you can see in Harvey's frontispiece, among the animals hatching from eggs are two insects, a butterfly um, and a locust. So insects are very important in this discourse, as many of you uh, will know. As Eric Joring has shown, the refutation of Aristotelian theory of spontaneous generation was the main achievement of Dutch natural historians who combined the use of magnifying instruments like microscopes with a specific reading of De Descartes. Although Descartes himself adhered to the concept of spontaneous generation, the Dutch physician Jan Swammerdam repeatedly referred to Descartes and his principle of the uniformity of nature to explain why insect reproduction could not be different from any other reproductive process in the entire creation. The observation of natural historians were deeply informed by a worldview that deemed spontaneous generation atheist because the laws of God would not allow any exception on the general way of when in the general way in which all of nature reproduced. Swamadam's Historia Generalis Insectorum, published in 1669, was arguably the most influential work on sexual procreation of insects in the second half of the 17th century, and certainly, quote, dealt a devastating blow to the conception of spontaneous generation, as Joring has argued. What I would like to highlight in this slide is the importance of attention paid to bodily parts. Uh, Swamatham's eighth chapter is entitled of the genitals, penis, uterus, testicles, ovary, and other parts subservient in generation. Uh, that's the top part of the slide. As you will see, see throughout my talk, genitals are ubiquitous in the discourse on generation, and looking at them was part and parcel of the theory formation. And I would argue looking at how people looked at these uh, made important, um, will may have important ramifications of how we understand the, the formation of this discourse. Observational practices, however, did not necessarily spark new theories, but could still be used to prove that spontaneous generation indeed happened. Um, and I left out a quick bit here, but Meriterel's work on Réamur has impressively demonstrated how a network of observers in France, the Dutch Republic and Switzerland established a deeper understanding of the reproductive cycles of aphids by spending weeks staring at plant lice, not uh, like these scholars spent weeks uh, staring at plant lice under glass containers and then communicating their findings in rather lengthy letters. The naturalists involved, Réaumur, Bonnet, Tremblay and Bazin, had established that aphids, so um, plant lice, actually reproduced mainly through pathogenesis, with occasional mating. In his book on the Enlightenment Microscope, Mark Radcliffe uses the example of cochineal studies to explain how microscopic observation changed, changed the thought on insect generation. After many decades of debate, natural historians from Italy, Spain, the, the Dutch Republic, France, and Britain not only established that uh, Dactylopius coccus, as it is known today, was indeed an insect and not a plant, but they also observed pathogenesis. This was also established for other insect species like viviparous lice. Radcliffe also shows the longevity of concepts and how spontaneous generation was discussed for the most of the 18th century indeed. 
he claims that, quote, the only generally accepted law was the pre-existence of the germ as opposed to spontaneism. And of course, this is a much more complicated story as many more of you in the audience uh, know and have been mentioning. As one of the debates involved the Jesuit Journal de, de Trévaux, the conflict has also often been inter interpreted along confessional lines. Also mentioned frequently in the current literature on natural theology in the early modern period, the theological literature on insect reproduction has not been studied in much detail. This is even more surprising as the, this body of work engaged very openly and very frankly with insect sexuality. As is widely acknowledged, insect played an important part in physical theology or natural theology and other religious texts around 1700. This has been studied extensively in the German context, most recently by Anne-Charlotte Trepp. It is, however, striking how little these studies discuss the ubiquitous reference to insect sexual behavior and the physiology of insect uh, reproduction that was part and parcel of the intention to non-charismatic microfauna in these 18th century texts. One of the most extensive of these texts is, uh, as you can see here, Friedrich Christian Lesser's well-known Insecto Theologia from 1738. Lesser based his book to a great extent on the Dutch studies mentioned earlier, and my discussion of his book will precisely revolve around how Lesser uses Baconian new science for his argument for design, to use a slightly anachronistic term. Like in other realms of natural history, book learning and practical experience went hand in hand. So the whole notion of collecting uh, not only specimens, but also books um, and experimenting is um, uh, an, main, an important um, part of the discussion I'm going to um, speak about. And Blumbach's uh, use of both collecting, uh, collecting collections, uh, books, but also experiments uh, will play uh, a role at the later part of my talk. As expected, Lesser also connected um, the um, credibility to exper experience, uh, like many of his um, fellow 18th century scholars. Of course, the most ubiquitous toppers in all of the 18th century natural history appeared in Lesser's book too. The reference not only to his own experience and observations, uh, but also um, the use of other um, observations. Interestingly, Lesser specifically mentioned instruments and collections as the main tools of research in his introduction to Insectotologia, uh, something that will become important later too. All these aspects are, of course, all these aspects are, of course, no surprise to historians of early modern science. But why did Lesser focus on generation to connect religion and natural history? Lesser, of course, took his inspiration from scripture and literally the beginning of the creation myth. Referring to Genesis, Lesser claimed, and I quote, uh, and I translate the quote here, the almighty, the almighty being which created insects through his almighty word has given them the power through ordinary procreation to multiply and reproduce the species. This is the Zeugungskraft um, in uh, my title and the notion of Kraft, as you can imagine, um, is uh, something that I'm uh, encountering everywhere now that I'm spending some time with my research group here in, in Hamburg. Um, and, and keep looking, you will find craft uh, and uh, power and force uh, anywhere in 18th century talks, uh, 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 publications. Okay, clearly not only observation, but also tradition, especially classical authors and scripture itself, was proof that the act was indeed necessary. Returning to Genesis, Lesser maintained that God had given any living organism the power to procreate, and this was true for insects too. The craft metaphor recurs constantly in Lesser, Lesser's work, as I have said. Combining this observation again, Lesser stressed that one can see the proper part, uh, and I um, um, translate the quote here, proper body parts for siring and giving birth in insects, as well as eggs uh, from which they spring. Lesser could end his chapter by asserting that the wise being himself was the only creator of species that multiplied through continuous procreation. Lesser described the basics of animal mating in a distinct chapter on proliferation and started with this definition on how, definition how procreation works. 
um, as you can see, lesser clearly for favored the sperm over the egg, um, but also compared insects to human beings and other animals. And he described the two practices of mating that he knew. And this is the part of the quotation here. Uh, and I'm uh, translating. Either insects mates with their bellies together or they get together from behind. Lessa provides lots of details and described male and female organs. And I quote in translation, and you'd see the original here. The male member can be found mostly at the rump, but sometimes also in the abdomen. They also have their rod and testicles. The size of those vary according to the size of the insects themselves. The female vulva on the female insect is rough in order to prevent chafing of this tender element during intercourse. Ordinarily, it is placed at the rump, but sometimes also at the upper part of the abdomen." End of quote. Lesser's detailed description of genitalia is not only astounding because of the religious nature of this text, but also because 65 years later, one of the most important entomologists of the later 18th century refuted any attention to genitalia in natural history. In 1803, Johann Christian Fabricius, often called the Linnaeus of insects, wrote an important article in one of the earliest specialized entomology journals, the Magazin der Insektenkunde, um, um, edited by uh, Karl Illinger. Addressing his critics, he explained why his, his taxonomic system was based on the mouth parts of insects, um, despite its flaws. He says, first, Genitalia are often too small to observe properly. And second, echoing, echoing Linnaeus, he argued that inquiry into, um, um, sorry, I lost, inquiry into genitals was abdom abominable and displeasing. Genitalium disquisitio abinumabilis displicit. This may come as a surprise to a historian of 18th century natural history, and especially botany, who are of course fully aware that Linnaeus based his plant taxonomy on plant reproductive organs. It is very difficult to ascertain why both Linnaeus and Fabricius had made this statement, but one explanation might be a differentiation between flora and fauna, where the morphology of the former was different enough from human reproductive organs. And although anthropomorphism was popular in botany and Linnaeus sexual system was severely criticized precisely for its attention to reproduction, Non-human animals seem to have been more closely connected to a discussion of human sexuality. Of course, Blumenbach took this up as well. Uh, in his uh, book, uh, Über die natürlichen Verschiedenheiten im Menschengeschlechter, on the natural varieties uh, in um, humankind, he writes um, about this, uh, and I have a lengthy quote here. You can uh, uh, read this, I will only, um, focus on the highlighted parts here. He mentioned Linnaeus's reservations, uh, but also called uh, the great um, Swede out for his hypocrisy. He says that uh, Linnaeus uh, found the um, uh, body parts uh, abominable, but also he used them himself in the uh, terminology for uh, the Venus uh, um, clam. Uh, and uh, said that uh, Linnaeus was using a schlüpfrige metaphorische Sprache, so a um, indecent uh, language. The important part here in this quote is the latter. It is a, a reference to his own uh, anatomical collections. As you can see here, um, he says um, that he has um, possessed the genitalia of a person of color. And I deliberately crossed out the offensive word here. What is striking, however, is Blumenbach's defeatism regarding the explanatory power of his specimen, of this specimen in his collection. Ob aber diese Eigenschaft allgemein oder der ganzen Nation eigen sei, weiß ich nicht. There's a very difficult and complicated story here uh, to tell um, about um, Blumenbach's um, engagement with discussion on uh, um, male uh, genitalia um, and um, kind of national differences. Uh, there's correspondence also with um, Joseph Banks about this, and I'm going to um, go uh, more into detail in, um, in, a, in this chapter, but today I just have to leave it here. 
what I found interesting uh, here is the um, the notion of um, or the the kind of continuation of discussions of uh, powers and um, metaphors um, in Blumenbach's uh, work that goes beyond the whole uh, Bildungstrieb uh, metaphor. And of course, Trieb and Kraft are important uh, notions that can have uh, multiple meanings. In the last couple of minutes, um, I, I will follow, um, 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 I will um, just uh, show a few more examples to highlight um, the kind of continuation of these uh, discourses. Let me show you um, how the question of Bildungstrieb also prompted another Göttingen servant to be Schlüpfrich, as Blumenbach had called uh, Linné earlier. When it comes to Schlüpfrichkeit and an obsession with bodies, everyone in Göttingen will know who comes next, Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. Let me close um, in the next uh, two minutes uh, with this uh, quote, which is also very difficult to uh, unpack. This is a letter from Lichtenberg to Blumenbach um, in 1789, uh, shortly before the first publication. Um, and uh, Lichtenberg kind of uh, describes how um, he, with the notion of the Bildungstrieb, he would be uh, unable to uh, look at young girls and boys, uh, Chapeau's is a kind of um, student uh, slang for um, kind of uh, young um, male students. Uh, he could not look at them without thinking about the um, uh, synapse, which is um, gall wasps, wasps who are important uh, species in the discussion also of procreation. Um, and I leave you to kind of read the, um, the quote. Um, and of course, it's full of innuendo and, um, um, and but also scholarship. So the whole uh, question of um, uh, kind of uh, learning, um, scholarly learning um, comes in um, here as well. Uh, but I think my time is running out, so I'm going to uh, just close with another um, important um, scholar of the 18th century who talked a lot about the similarities between insects and humans and how uh, body parts um, can be used for identifying uh, character. And this is, of course, uh, uh, Lafata. He used these images and the accompanying text to extrapolate the possibility of human physiognomy from insect physiognomy by asserting that each element or member, um, and of course uh, the term a member here has a, a double meaning of the body uh, that could be used to make physiognomic uh, interferences as the German quote you can see here implies. In, again, insects are used for understanding human behavior. Apparently Linnaeus's uh, Noscete Ipsum had put humans firmly in the animal kingdom. Of course, this was further developed in the, eight, in the 19th century, as we all know. But we also know that not only the Victorians were obsessed with sex, it was also the Enlightenment. One name you might uh, have missed during my talk is Michel Foucault. And of course, one cannot talk about the history of sex without mentioning him and the history of the sexual act, as it is entangled with the history of sexual identities. Not surprisingly, insects played an important part in the creation of these identities too, as Ross Brooks has recently shown in a paper on French and German human responses to same-sex copulation in the cockchafer. I will uh, close my talk today um, with a, another example of a collection. This is from uh, the University of Glasgow, uh, the Hunterian Museum, and James uh, King's collection uh, in the late 19th century, where he caught plant hoppers caught in the act uh, in Koito. He had apparently literally caught them uh, in the act and put them in his collection. And it would be interesting to know more about why Blumenbach had um, a human penis in his collection uh, and what that means for his uh, development of his theory. Thank you very much. <laughs>